So welcome to the Dr. Gundry podcast. You know, um, imagine what it would be like to be confined to an electric wheelchair for years. And then one day, being able to walk and even ride your bike again. So well, my guest today knows exactly what that feels like and says food, imagine that, helped her get her life back. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Terry Walls, a professor at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine, a modern day medical marvel, and a friend of mine who I've known now for a number of years. In 2000, Dr. Walls was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, an autoimmune disease that affects more than 2.3 million people worldwide. And after steady years of decline, despite being a professor of medicine, she was actually able to turn things around with her WALLS protocol. She invented that in 2007. It's basically, and I'm not going to put words in her mouth, a hunter-gatherer diet that employs food as medicine. And the results are absolutely astounding. I hope you've seen her on the internet. Within a year, Terry was able to walk throughout a hospital without a cane, even though she had been in a motorized wheelchair, and she even completed an 18-mile bike tour. So today we're going to discuss Dr. Wall's journey, how the right diet can dramatically decrease the symptoms of MS and other serious health issues. So Terry, thank you for joining us. It's great to see you again. Hey, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. So. Maybe start right in and explain to our listeners and viewers what is MS and what do the symptoms look like? So uh, it is a inflammatory disease uh, where you have damage to the spinal cord and or the brain. Uh, we think it's mediated by immune cells that are attacking the myelin. Uh, but we now know, and that's the... Uh, insulation on the wiring between brain cells, but we also know now that the brain cells themselves are also damaged. And because these damages can occur anywhere in the spinal cord or the brain, no two patients look exactly the like. You'll have sensory disturbances, uh, commonly uh, visual problems, sometimes balance problems. Uh, you may develop motor problems, so weakness, balance troubles, uh, stumbling, falling. Uh, and sensory problems uh, with pain. Uh, and it's a progressive illness. Yeah, so take, take us through, I mean, here you are a physician. Uh, take us through, you know, what was happening to you. And because I think your story is, you know, is, I could hear it a thousand times and not get tired of it. So, you know, I, I had my first set of symptoms during medical school. I had episodes of electrical face pain involving either the, the right side of my face or the left side of my face. These episodes would come on more frequently if I was sleep deprived or under severe stress. Uh, then the next uh, round, and these became progressively a, a bit more frequent, more severe uh, after uh, medical school and residency. I had an episode of dim vision in my left eye. Uh, and that went away. Uh, and then 13 years later, I started stumbling and having uh, uh, problems with my left leg. Had a, a big evaluation with a, spi uh, a spinal tap, MRIs of my brain, my spinal cord, uh, lots and lots of blood tests, nerve conduction velocity tests. Uh, and I was found to have abnormal spinal fluid and lesions in my spinal cord at the level of my neck. Uh, my physician said, you know, I forgot to mention that you were blind in your left eye uh, 13 years ago. Uh, so that was sort of uh, interesting that I would forget something so dramatic. Uh, and he said, you know, you have relapsing remitting MS. That episode 13 years ago was probably optic neuritis. I don't think these episodes of face pain are necessarily related. Uh, and he suggested that I start a disease-modifying therapy, uh, which I did. And then, you know, I also decided that I wanted to treat my disease aggressively and be sure I was getting the, the very best care. So I sought out the best center that was doing uh, research here in the Midwest. That was the Cleveland Clinic. I saw their best people, and they agreed that I had uh, MS and that disease-modifying drugs uh, were appropriate. So, you know, so I saw three different MS specialists who all agreed 
with the diagnosis and with the plan. And then what happened? Well, you know, I, I, can, I, I took all those drugs. I had an episode of weakness involving my right hand uh, in the uh, next year. So had I been in a drug study, that would have been a huge success. But I was continuing to get slowly worse uh, every year. My Cleveland Clinic uh, physicians told me about the work of Lauren Cordain. I read his papers, read his books, and decided uh, that it made sense. And so after being a vegetarian for 20 years, I gave up all grain, all legumes, all dairy, went back to eating meat, and continued to decline. The next year, I needed a two-decline wheelchair. I took uh, mitoxantral, which is a form of chemotherapy. I continued to decline. I then took uh, Tizabri, which is the new, very potent biologic drug. I was very excited to take that. I continued to decline, and then I was uh, put on Celsept. You know, and, and that's, you know, Steve, it's so clear to me that the, the best drugs, the newest drugs, the best people are not stopping my decline. And I'm clearly headed towards becoming uh, bedridden, quite possibly demented. Uh, and remember, I, I said I had uh, fa- uh, these electrical face pains, trigeminal neuralgia, that were getting steadily worse. Uh, and so I was I was beginning to be quite concerned that I was going to have my face pain turned permanently on so that, you know, all sensory input, light, sound, touch, uh, a breeze on my skin would trigger these electrical pains. So uh, this is uh, difficult. Uh, And so ultimately I decided to go back to reading the basic science literature, trying to see what, what else I could do. You know, and of course, at first I'm looking for the latest drug therapy. And then it occurs to me like, you know, I, I should be investigating things I could access. So I start reading uh, ultimately about uh, vitamins and supplements. And there's really not that much in the MS world. There's a bit more in uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, uh, ALS. So I, I'm reading all of these disease states and I see that mitochondrial dysfunction is the big driver. And uh, I decide that mitochondrial dysfunction is probably the big driver for MS-related disability as well. Uh, and so I, you know, based on all these animal models, I would uh, eventually develop a supplement cocktail uh, designed specifically for my mitochondria and my brain. I, I start taking those. You know, and after six months, I, uh, the, the conventional professor of medicine takes over. I decide I'm wasting my money. I stop all my supplements. I'm so disgusted. Uh, and you know, within 24 hours, I'm even more exhausted, and I just cannot get out of bed. I can't function. After three days, my, my wife comes in and says, you know, honey, I think you ought to take these again. <laughs> I, I take them, and 24 hours later, I can get up and go to work, and I think, now that is really interesting. So two weeks later, I, I do the same thing. I stop all my supplements, uh, and again, 24 hours later, I'm... Uh, totally exhausted, uh, can't function. I wait three days, I start them back up, uh, and 24 hours later, I'm back up, uh, and I can go to work. So now I'm, I'm very excited that my supplements may not be fixing me, but clearly they're doing something that's very, very important. And I decided what they're doing is slowing down my decline, and they are helping my fatigue, because clearly I'm more functional when I'm taking them. So at, at this point, uh, I've been reassigned to work on the Institutional Review Board, uh, and so I'm reviewing the clinical trials for safety issues, uh, and I tell the IRB that I would like to read all of the brain-related studies. Uh, and so now all the trials that I'm, I'm reading are related to the brain. I'm getting more and more comfortable reading uh, the brain research. Uh, and you know I keep adding to my supplement cocktail. And then the summer of 2007, you know, my chief of staff calls me in and tells me he's assigned me to the traumatic brain injury clinic. I'll start there in January in about six months. I'll be seeing patients without residence, which means I'll have to get up and examine folks. And this is a, a, a task that I know I probably cannot do. Uh, so this is pretty tough because I realize that I'll probably now finally have to apply for medical disability uh, in January. But, you know, God works in mysterious ways, Steve. Uh, the following week, I uh, in my packet is a 
protocol that uses electrical stimulation of muscles for spinal cord injured patients. I read through that and ultimately convince my uh, physical therapist to add electrical stimulation to my uh, physical therapy program. So I, I start uh, doing that in his clinic. Um, and uh, also at the same time, I run into uh, the Institute for Functional Medicine on the internet, and they have a course on neuroprotection, which I order, and I uh, begin working my way through. And this is pretty tough because, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with brain fog. Uh, my fatigue is more severe. Uh, so it's, take, it's, it's a while to get through all these lectures, get through these cases. Um, I have a deeper understanding of mitochondrial dysfunction. I have a longer list of supplements, which I add. Not a lot is happening yet. Uh, at this point, I am so weak I cannot sit up in, in a chair anymore. I have a zero-gravity chair, one at home, one at work, where I recline and my knees are higher than my nose. I can walk, you know, maybe 10 feet using two walking sticks. I'm losing my keys and my phone. I've lost them a couple times that summer, uh, which is sort of expensive. Um, and my face pains are getting more frequent, more severe, more difficult to control. Uh, but again, you know, I discovered the Institute for Functional Medicine. I've added their supplements. I've added eStem. And then I had this really big aha moment like, what if I redesign my paleo diet uh, based on the supplements that I'm taking, figure out where these nutrients are in the food supply? So that's more research, and, and the Linus Pauling Institute uh, online uh, really helps me create these long lists of foods that I'm going to start stressing. And December 26th, on uh, 2007, we, you know, we start this new, very focused way of eating where I'm really focused on what to eat as opposed to my previous focus was what I couldn't eat. Uh, and then, you know, January comes and I go off to the traumatic brain injury clinic. Uh, now, the first week, I'm just watching, so I should be able to do that. The second week, you know, I'm beginning to examine these patients. And, you know, and to my surprise, Steve, at the end of the week, I thought, well, you know, that wasn't too bad. I was actually able to see those patients. And the end of the third week, I'm thinking, yeah, I can, I can do this. And I'm also making the observation that, you know, my energy is better. And I'm feeling like my mental clarity is improved. Uh, at the end of uh, three months, I begin walking with a cane at the hospital. And people are, you know, are just astounded when they see me walking because it's been, um, you know, about four years uh, since anyone had seen me walking around. Because you're literally in a motorized wheelchair. Yes, motorized wheelchair, wheelchair reclined. So I'm going around in the wheelchair, and I'm reclined going around in the wheelchair. So to see me upright uh, w was really quite astounding. Um, and then at six months, I'm walking without a cane. At nine months, and so this is Mother's Day. Well, actually, you know, even and before that, I, I call my uh, neurologist and say, there's been a big change. I think I need to see you. Uh, and... He sees me and I walk in. He, you know, his nursing staff are astounded. He's astounded. Uh, he's so excited. Uh, he uh, orders an MRI, and we're actually both disappointed because my lesions have not changed. I have lesions in my spinal cord and, a, and a, just a, a couple in my head. Uh, and he says, you know, that was probably naive to think that they were going to change because these are these are these lesions are eight years old. So of course they're not going to change. Uh, and he said, no, clearly you have rewired your spinal cord and you're rewiring your brain. Uh, so a, a few months later, and, you know, I'm continuing to improve and I decide to uh, uh, do a bike ride. Uh, my family's in a panic. They don't think it's safe for me to ride my bike. So that's been six years. We have a big family meeting. Wife uh, decides that it's okay. So she has my son jog on the left, my daughter jog on the right, and she's going to uh, the, the chaser on her bike, uh, and I bike around the block. Now, my kids are crying, I'm crying, Jackie's crying, and if you could uh, see me now, my, my eyes are still cheering up now because that was such a miraculous moment. Because it was at that moment that I understood that the current understanding of multiple sclerosis and progressive MS 
is incorrect or incomplete. Uh, and that who knew how much recovery might be possible. Uh, and so that that <clears throat> really changed how I understood disease and health. It would change the way I practice medicine, and it would ultimately change the focus of my research. So take us back to January. You, you know, you had you know read all of Lauren Cordain's The Paleo Diet, professor yes. at Colorado State. What what change in your diet occurred that that January? Sure. So I had also removed eggs. Uh, so there's one more food that I removed, and I really ramped up the vegetables. So I uh, had a huge amount of greens. I was probably having uh, six cups of greens every day. Um, I was also dramatically emphasizing the cabbage, uh, onion, and mushroom family vegetables. Uh, And then I was ramping up uh, the color, uh, uh, things that were deeply pigmented. And I put a lot more emphasis on variety uh, in terms of uh, uh, all of the foods uh, that I was having. Uh, The other thing that I did was uh, we decided that the only food I was going to eat uh, was organic that if it wasn't organic, I, I was not eating it. Because, you know, and I was doing all this, Steve, not to recover. Because I, you know, my neurologist, all of my physicians had, had always told me, secondary progressive MS, you don't recover. Uh, functions once lost are gone forever. And so I, I added the E-STEM. I, I had this complicated supplement regimen. Uh, and then I had this very intensive nutrition. I also added in a meditation again. And I did this to slow the decline. Because I, I, you know, I could still walk sh- very short distances. And I knew if that was huge, I wanted to hang on to that as long as I could. Uh, yeah, and the other thing that's sort of surprising, Steve, is that with a progressive neurologic disorder, you end up uh, finally, when you get to acceptance, you can just let go and take each day as it unfolds. So here I am, remarkably better. I'm walking around. Yeah, I can walk around the block again. Uh, But I'm still taking every day, one day at a time, as it unfolds. I don't really know what this means. But the day I got on my bike, that's when I was like, I'm recovering. I'm who knows how much recovery might be possible? Wow, no wonder everybody's crying. Yeah, I'm still crying. You know, yeah. it's, it's 10 years and I'm still crying when I tell that story. So, so what, you know, how did that, that's obviously, it, that was a moment that obviously kind of changed your career path. Um, yes. W- tell me, you know, what happened? How did, how did that affect you? So in primary care and in my traumatic brain injury clinic, I start talking more and more about diet quality, uh, stress patterns, uh, toxin exposures, physical activity levels, and how those impact health. And getting my uh, veterans fired up about diet and uh, lifestyle. Uh, in the traumatic brain injury clinic, my partners would say, "You know, there's nothing we can do. You'll recover or not." And I'd walk in and say, no, 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 there's a lot we can do. We can be sure that you're getting rid of the foods that are uh, inflammatory and destructive, ramp up the foods that are helpful, uh, uh, address sleep, address stress, uh, get you exercising again. And you could tell who I saw in the traumatic brain injury clinic because those guys would still be working, they'd still have uh, their spouse, and they'd still be involved in family life, whereas the people I hadn't seen had lost their jobs uh, and were divorced. And in my primary care clinics, now mind you, I I was using, I wasn't talking about drugs anymore. I was just talking about vegetables uh, and and walking and getting step counters. But suddenly, my patients with diabetes were reversing their diabetes. My patients with high blood pressure were reversing their high blood pressure. My patients with severe obesity were losing weight. The people with severe mental health problems, anxiety, depression, PTSD, were highly functioning again. Uh, and and my, my uh, residents 
were beginning to get fired up about diet and lifestyle. And you know, and they, they were uh, really pretty funny. They would, they, you know, and they were very impressed that I could convince nearly every curmudgeon that I ran into to begin making these huge changes in their diet and lifestyle. So the residents would say, you know, Doc, Doc, I can't wait to see how you get, you know, Joe Blow, uh, how he's going to respond because, you know, I haven't been able to do anything with him. But, and you know, then I walk in uh, and um, tell them in very basic uh, ways that, you know, if, if you don't feed, if you want a, a blue ribbon steer or swine, you got to give them the best rations. Like, yeah, 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 they get that. And if you want the best output on your cornfields, you got to test the soil and take care of it. Yeah, yeah, they get that. It's like, well, we got to do the same for you, buddy. And the light bulb goes off. So you have to tell a story and a metaphor that makes sense to that person's educational and work life. And when you do that, then they will go on that journey with you. Uh, and so it, it really transformed the primary care clinic. It transformed the uh, traumatic uh, brain injury clinic. But I did have a few practitioners who were very uneasy and uh, filed complaints. So then my chief of staff you know, called me and said, okay, Terry, what's going on? People are complaining about you. So uh, that was a very uh, interesting conversation, of course. So, you know, and you and I uh, obviously get that now in our, our careers all the time that, you know, this, this is a placebo effect or we're going against, you know, telling people that they need to get their blood pressure under control with one or two or three medications. Um, how did that go with your chief of staff? Well, you know, he was... Um a little concerned, uh, and so then we had a follow-up meeting, and I brought down a cart of 85 papers with me, uh, to, and I had them sort of classified to explain, here's the science behind all of this. Uh, and it goes, well, uh, but, but you still can't do that. You have to follow the standard of care. And I go, well, you know, I, I'm perfectly happy doing that uh, when I get an email that goes out to all of the faculty that we have to follow standard of care and we're not able to use the latest uh, science uh, that we're reading in the New England Journal and elsewhere to guide our decision making. So, so if that's how we're gonna, how we're all gonna practice here at the VA, I, of course I will do that. And th and I smiled. <laughs> There's a big pause. Goes well. I s you you have a point. I see. I uh, and so um, it, it, what we agreed was that. I always had to have a scientific rationale. I'd have to be very careful to document in the medical record that, that what I was doing was a uh, alternative to FDA-approved care based on the latest science. Uh, and so I was very careful in my charts now to always document that this is not FDA-approved. This is based on – and sometimes I'd, I'd quote papers. Sometimes I'd just quote uh, the, some of the latest science studies. And – when I gave give public lectures, I have this big disclaimer slide that I always start with saying, this this is education. It's I'm talking about non FDA approved alternatives, uh, uh, so that I'm very careful to not overstate my claims, uh, but to always uh, state that I'm using science and we're trying to improve physiology, and and that depending on where you're at in your disease process. You may stop your decline, you might regress your decline, or it's possible you'll continue to decline, that you'll want to work very closely with your personal physicians uh, to monitor your medication use because those needs may change. And so far, so good. You know, it's all worked out uh, very well. And, and you know wh what is fun, Steve? So a as you know, I... I uh, was directed to do a little feasibility trial, which we did, and we had stunning results. Then we did another um, two more studies after that, again, stunning results. And as I've gone around the university talking about our results with these amazing videos that I have, people have decided that, you know, maybe I'm on to something. <laughs> uh, and uh, so what had seemed to be so odd and eccentric 10 years ago is now being seen as this brilliant, bold, visionary approach. 
And uh, is that because seeing is believing that even skeptics have to say, well, wait a minute here. Um, well, look at you this. Know, I, I think it's because, you know, I, I've, I have done the research at sort of a slow, tedious process. You do the pilot studies, then you can do larger pilots, and that keeps going. But when I started getting my, um, my results published in peer review journaled, uh, and now that my uh, research is being cited by uh, other uh, uh, authors and researchers, um, you know, I'm getting a lot more respect, a lot more appreciation. I, I have a, an appointment now in the Department of Neurology. I teach the neurology residents uh, about uh, nutrition uh, and MS. So, we're, you know, progress has happened. But it's but it's because uh, I think because I uh, take take I'm very cautious to not overstate my claims, and most importantly, I do the research. Yeah, I think. Uh... And congratulations on you know doing the hard research. Uh, nobody can you know pick your research apart. Um, it's yes, good I mean, stuff. It, it, it's so important to do that. If we're going to change the standard of care, we have to have uh, uh, research peer reviewed, uh, published, and you have you have to go out and present those findings. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, so you have, you've had three best-selling books now. Um, That's pretty exciting, yeah. Yeah, and you know, and you've you've certainly branched from just MS to you know autoimmune diseases in yes. general. Um, and so what you you said you know well I used to I eliminated foods and that's a big part of what I advise as well. But the big change was obviously when you added other foods in. So yeah. for a person with MS, or for that matter, autoimmune diseases, what, what sort of foods you know, are good for you? And I think you've alluded to that, but what's your prescription? So uh, I want people to ramp up their vegetables, uh, ideally a minimum of nine cups a day. Now, if you're very petite and you're like only four foot 10, yes, it's, it's gonna have to be uh, somewhat less. Um, the greens um, have a lots of vitamin K and carotenoids, uh, which are critical for retinal health, uh, brain health. Uh, and there's more and more research coming out that vitamin K is very important in making myelin and very important to brain stem cells that are going to be uh, involved in making the cells that will be involved in repairing the myelin damage and repairing the synapses. Uh, so greens, incredibly important. Uh, the cabbage family, onion family, vegetables uh, boost the detox pathways. They also boost pathways involved in neurotransmitters. Uh, mushrooms um, uh, uh, boost your natural killer cells, which are good for your uh, immune cell function. Uh, and there's actually a couple more papers that have come out showing that lion's mane mushroom is good for nerve growth factor. But this uh, a very recent paper came out last month that showed it's more than just lion's mane, that we have multiple culinary mushrooms that have been shown to boost nerve growth factor. And nerve growth factor is one of the nurturing hormones that um, are very helpful for trophic support or, or support for uh, brain cell health overall. And then uh, the deeply pigmented uh, foods uh, are rich in polyphenols and antioxidants. And the, we have many, many studies showing that the more color you eat, the lower the rates of uh, dementia, lower rates of cancer, lower rates of diabetes, lower rates of mental health problems. Uh, and that we have some uh, great studies that have used even just a cup of blueberries uh, equivalents in randomized controlled trials that show in just 16 weeks or 24 weeks we can get improvement in thinking. So those are, are uh, very powerful reasons to ramp up those vegetables. I encourage uh, fermented foods uh, and seaweed as well. Great, where does olive oil play in your program? Uh, swim in it, drink it, it's, <laughs> it's really good. You know, there are so many studies uh, that are, are show the benefits of olive oil for cardiovascular health uh, and for uh, brain health as well. 
I love uh, for people to use olive oil. I prefer that they use it cold because when you heat olive oil, you lose a lot of the uh, antioxidants and you accidentally make some trans fats in the skillet. So I'd much rather people um, bake, roast, steam, and then pour their olive oil uh, on cold at the end. So lots of olive oil. Um, I, I'm, I'm, all, and I'm very keen on ketogenic eating. Uh, I, I, I talk now that you can – you want to monitor your lipids and know if you tolerate a coconut oil or if, uh, if your lipids go up with coconut oil, then you're just going to use the olive oil uh, with your ketogenic plan. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's something I, I stress. Uh, I, I take care of a lot of people with the APOE4 mutation. Yeah. And uh, uh, coconut oil, and I follow their lipids, and coconut oil, particularly in these folks, really makes their small, dense lipids go up, and they oxidize those small, dense uh, LDLs. So I'm... My, yeah, you know, I, if you're going to go on a ketogenic diet, and I have a lot of folks on a ketogenic diet, it's very popular right now, and they use lots of butter, lots of bacon, and they're not advising these folks to monitor their lipids. I think that's a disservice. Um, I, I think you need to know how your lipids are responding so you can sort out, uh, is olive oil what you're going to use? Uh, do you have to use uh, periodic fasting instead? Um, or are you able to use um, butter? Are you able to use coconut oil? Uh, it's a very important question. So. You can start whichever way uh, your culinary tastes take you, but check your lipids, please, and then see. Make then you can decide which way to continue. Well, you know, I, I absolutely agree with almost everything you're saying. In fact, one of the things I tell my patients now is I want them to be a gorilla who lives in Italy, uh, and and by that I mean I, I want them to eat a lot of leaves and I want them to pour olive oil on it. Which yeah. brings us to what's behind you. For those of you who are listening rather than viewing, uh, can you please describe, you have a bunch of friends on the shelves behind you. Can you describe them for us? I am covered with poop all around me. <laughs> I have poop over my shoulder, poop uh, by me uh, on the computer here. Uh, poop is so important. This is sort of my poop shrine. Could we suggest more personal hygiene or no? <laughs> what she's saying, folks, is she actually has uh, uh, dolls and puppets that are shaped like giant piles of poop, and they have a smiley face and eyes. So she's not actually covered in poop. Thank you for being precise there, Steve. Yeah, she, she is surrounded by poop in, in her room, I can assure you. But uh, doll poop. <laughs> poop emoji. Poop emojis, that's right. Yes, thank you. You know, uh, our microbiome uh, um, metabolizes the food we eat, uh, and those small metabolites get into our bloodstream. And they, these metabolites run the chemistry of life. So for the steps that we can no longer perform, if our microbiome metabolites filled in those gaps, then we, our ancestral mothers had reproductive success. And at that moment in our lineage, we um, exported that gene from our ancestral DNA to our microbiome DNA, which is why having a diverse uh, microbiome is so, so helpful. Uh, so we talk a lot about poop uh, in my clinics. We talk a lot about poop in my clinical trials. And I tell people, you know, I ask people, are you pooping rocks, logs, snakes, pudding, or tea? If it's pudding or tea, you need less fiber. So uh, cut back on the fiber, uh, cut back on the raw vegetables. Uh, if you're pooping snakes, that's perfect. If they get into your pants, you probably have to back off a little bit because that's you know, socially not very helpful. If you're pooping logs very comfortably and easily, that's okay. If you're pooping rocks, you need more vegetables, more fermented foods, and more fiber. I think I may have shared with you, but if I didn't, you know, I, I know your fondness for nine cups of vegetables. And when I was writing The Plant Paradox, I, I said that, you know, when you look down in the toilet bowl, you should see a giant anaconda looking back yes. up at you. And my editor said, wait a minute, there was a movie called Anaconda where it's coming out of a toilet bowl. <laughs> and I don't think we want that visual. And so we 
changed it to snake, but uh, I, I credit you uh, with that passage in my book. So. Oh, perfect. I'm happy, to, happy, happy for that. All right, all right. So uh, what are the worst foods for people with autoimmune disease? Yeah, well, sugar uh, is really terrible for us all. It, it feeds the wrong microbiome. Uh, gluten and casein have a lot of cross-reactivity with uh, um, structures in our brain. Uh, and that drives increased inflammation and molecular mimicry, damaging structures in our brain and in our cerebellum. Uh, so th that's really bad. Uh, the third most common food sensitivity is eggs. So that's why I take eggs out. Uh, and then uh, soy can be a problem. Peanuts can be a problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, in my plan, uh, I have sort of a staged process. So uh, the level one, we take out gluten, dairy, and eggs and ramp up the vegetables. Then I get progressively more restrictive as people are willing to go on a more intense journey towards health. Now, I know you're, you're a pretty big proponent of grass-fed meats, organ meats, uh, liver and gizzards. Where, where does that fit in with all these vegetables? Well, you know, I really like to have people um, get... Uh, organic meat, grass-fed meat, according to what they can afford. I really like them to have liver uh, once to twice a week. Uh, if they can find it, heart once a week uh, would be ideal. Oysters, mussels, that would be marvelous as well. Uh, when you get these organ meats, we get more fat-soluble vitamins, more uh, uh, CoQ in that meat. You get If it's a grass-fed animal, then you're going to get uh, vitamin K2. Uh, particularly in that, in that liver. You'll also get retinol. Uh, and uh, if we're thinking, well, I can make uh, retinol or vitamin A from the beta carotene, that depends on the genetic variations of the enzymes that convert beta carotene to retinol. Uh, and, and I tell my patients that if they have a uh, autoimmune illness, if they have a uh, cancer or uh, cancer dysplasia illness, that tells me that their enzymes that involved in making retinol are less efficient, and they, in particular, would do very well at eating liver. So in my uh, VA, we would teach people you know, how to make uh, green smoothies, how to make cooked greens, and we talk a lot about how to make liver uh, so it would actually be quite tasty. And by the way, you know, my kids uh, like liver and onions. When my daughter is going to make an exotic meal for friends, she will include uh, liver in that uh, meal. Ah. So um, what do you say to the argument that um, meats in general are aging and beef, uh, red meats may contribute to cancer? Uh, I know you're from the Midwest, and that's where I came from. So, so if your uh, meat, if you have a really high protein intake, uh, you may be uh, increasing your mammalian target of rampamycin, and that is a pro-growth hormone. Uh, and so, you could be increasing your rates of benign and cancerous tumors, uh, which is one of the reasons I am not a proponent of the carnivore diet, because uh, you're going to have a high uh, mTOR. Uh, I would much rather moderate the meat intake. So compared to the paleo diet, the meat intake that I recommend uh, is actually quite a bit lower. Uh, so uh, I think meat is complete protein. It's good for us, um, particularly if you have grass-fed meats. If we're having uh, factory-farmed meat, that's a different kind of meat, uh, and it may be more inflammatory. Um, when, when people are looking at the research that says the TMAO – uh, is a problem, and, and that may increase atherosclerosis. Um, what what they forget is it, it has to do with the microbiome. And is that, did that meat become harmful because the person was eating a diet high in trans fats and high in sugar, which changed the microbiome remarkably away from the type of microbiome our ancestral mothers and fathers would have had? Yeah, and I think there's some, you know, really exciting research that actually was, to the Cleveland Clinic's credit, uh, done partially by them, that there's components in a lot of extra virgin olive oil, balsamic vinegar, and red wine that paralyzes the enzyme systems of bacteria to 
keep them from making TMAO from choline and uh, uh, acetyl L carnitine. You know, I, I think this is a this is a interesting but complicated story. If red meat was a problem, our ancestral mothers and fathers would not have had reproductive success. So what what changed? It's not just the red meat. It may be what we're feeding our uh, conventional farmers. It's certainly what we're feeding ourselves. Uh, you know, if we're eating our uh, six cups of greens, you know, nine cups of vegetables, uh, we have a very different microbiome. Uh, and I. I think it's an interesting question that we're going to continue to tease out. All right. So how do you make uh, eating nine cups of vegetables enjoyable? So uh, the first thing we talk about is why, why do vegetables uh, appear to be bitter? Uh, and, and they have a high pH, so they're sort of alkaline. Uh, uh, you have two strategies. One is adding more fat. So olive oil, our good friend, or clarified butter uh, can also work. Uh, people are thrilled when I say, you know, you could fry up bacon, let's save the bacon fat, stir your vegetables in with the bacon fat, uh, because that fat will uh, take care of that bitterness. Then the second tool you have is some acid. So you could add uh, lemon juice, lime juice, uh, balsamic vinegar, apple cider vinegar, bring the pH down. And again, that takes care of the bitterness. Because if the food is bitter, your kids will push back. If you If you lower the pH with some acidity, add oil, the kids will say like, mom, this is delicious. And they'll be uh, delighted to eat it. Yeah, one of my original recipes was Br Brussels sprouts you'll eat. And it actually yes. used uh, bacon fat and bits of bacon. And yeah, it's a, it's a great trick. Yeah. You know, the, the recipe for vegetables that I would teach my vets is you, you take up two to four slices of bacon, fry them to the desired level of Christmas, take the slices of bacon out, chop them up, Put your vegetables in the bacon fat, stir, cook two minutes or less, just until uh, the greens, they're wilted. If it's Brussels sprouts, you know, two minutes. Take them off the heat, add the uh, crumpled bacon, and serve. And they're like, oh, my God, that sounds delicious. I said, yes. If it wasn't delicious, just double the bacon and do it again. <laughs> you'll, you'll do anything to get greens in your yes. patients. That's good. That's good. So what, what we want to do, you, you mentioned that you experimented, and I think still do, with supplements. And so take me, take me through, you, you noticed, you know, you were a, an N of one, you were the guinea pig, and you noticed a difference on and off supplements. And I used to think supplements made expensive urine, I really did. Uh, I don't anymore. Um, I have some clinical papers that I publish with people on and off certain supplements, looking at the uh, flexibility of their blood vessels, their endothelial function. So give me your take now on where, even if you're eating a perfect diet, what is the place of supplements, if any? So um, I really want it to be personalized based on your family history, so your genetic vulnerability, uh, and your ethnic background. I certainly want everyone to get a vitamin D level uh, and then have their supplementation to maximize their vitamin D level. Uh, and then as they're increasing their vitamin D intake, I want them to couple that with vitamin K2. Uh, my preference is to get K2 out of emu oil because uh, then we know it's uh, natural K2 as opposed to a synthetic K2. Uh, the other uh, supplement that I uh, like uh, is a uh, extra virgin uh, cod liver oil. Uh, I, uh, the molecularly distilled um, fish oils are helpful in that uh, you, there's less fear of contamination. However, when you molecularly distill, I don't know... Uh, if that changes some of the characteristics of the uh, fish oil. So that's where an extra virgin cod liver oil may be superior. Uh, curcumin or turmeric, I think, can be extremely helpful in terms of boosting your uh, detoxification uh, efficiency. Uh, the other nutrients uh, that I uh, like to monitor have to do with homocysteine level which look at the efficiency of your um, vitamin B metabolism. And then I adjust uh, to get your homocysteine within the uh, target range. Now, beyond that, depending on your symptoms, your disease state, 
uh, and your family history, I may make additional recommendations to boost your um, detox pathways uh, or some of your neurotransmitter function. Uh, but uh, ideally, we personalize this based on an exam and perhaps some targeted uh, lab testing. Okay. So, as you know, I, I like people to try and get major dietary lectins out of their mm -hmm. diet. What, what's your thoughts about eliminating major lectins? So, um, we have a, a, a similar approach in that I think lectins uh, can be a huge problem for many individuals. Um, however, in my practice, I give people an entry-level diet to begin with. Uh, and then I progress them towards a more lectin-reduced uh, diet uh, as, as they go so we can get symptom uh, elimination. Now, I do find that I can, for 80% of my folks, uh, do great uh, just going on my level one diet, and we do not have to progress. Uh, I am able to predict based on some, some disease states, particularly rheumatoid arthritis and uh, autoimmune issues involving joints, that they're going to need uh, the l very low lectin diet. Yeah, I think I think that's very true. Uh, we we definitely see, uh, particularly in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, fairly immediate changes in in symptoms. Uh, by yeah, it's 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 often striking. Yeah, I try very hard to get the rheumatoid arthritis patient and the patient who has an autoimmune process involving their joints to do the elimination diet first up, but. Sometimes they're ready and sometimes they need to do level one and, and work their way to it. I feel very strong that people uh, have a lot of self-determination. Uh, and so you, you present the options and either they're, they're ready to do the elimination diet or like, okay, well, we'll start here with level one and we'll see how you, how you do. That's good. That's good. Okay. Um, your, your critics say you're giving false hope to people with MS. What say you? Well, what say me is that I do the clinical research. So, you know, a lot of folks say that, well, you never had MS because progressive MS, you don't recover. You're, you're, uh, the Cleveland Clinic must be incompetent. The University of Iowa must be incompetent. The Marshfield Clinic must be incompetent. And my response is, we're all unique. Who knows, maybe everybody was incompetent that took care of me. The real question is, what about those prospective trials that I've done that have shown benefit each time I've done the trials? Uh, and why not give your patients the option to change their diet, have a more nutrient-dense diet, add stress reduction, add movement, and see what happens? Um, and the decision to take drugs or not take drugs, uh, that's up to the neurologist and the patient. I'm simply advocating that as part of everyone's wellness plan for whatever health challenge you have, whether it's a MS or another an autoimmune condition or other uh, medical problems such as diabetes. Diet and lifestyle should be part of your wellness plan. Uh, and I think the Walls diet is a great diet. Um, and, and unlike um, most other uh, uh, diet authors also do research, so We've done the research that uh, tests the efficacy of the diet, and we've done research on the nutrients contained within the diet. So I can say, and we just published the analysis uh, of the Walls diet um, in nutrients, which showed that, in fact, it it's, it's performs superiorly to the, uh, the healthy eating plan, the uh, government uh, sanctioned food pyramid. <laughs> yeah, food pyramid plan. Thank you. So uh, the research answers that question, as it should for for anyone who's advocating for any kind of uh, uh, intervention. Perfect. Yeah, your your last book, the Walls Protocol: Cooking for Life, uh, came out about two years ago. Yeah, and yeah, we'll that book. you know it's a it's a fantastic book. And where can people find it? The obvious places. So the obvious places, you know, please go to your local bookstore. Uh, we want to keep those bookstores going. Go there. You can always go to my website, terrywalls.com. And we have a one-page uh, handout to get people started at terrywalls.com forward slash diet. Perfect. So since my uh, new book, The Longevity Paradox, came out a few weeks ago, I've been asking all my guests the same question. 
What's the one thing listeners can do today for a longer, healthier life? Eat more greens. You know, have a goal of at least one heaping plate full of greens. Uh, if you're really ambitious, go for two. That's, I totally agree with that. So, uh, Terry, thanks so much for joining us today. We've got a reader question, and I think yes. this is right up your alley. So, um, let's see. Kirky Mama on Instagram. My husband says he needs more meat than the longevity paradox allows. He says he will be too hungry. Your response? Well, I think I know what it's going to be. So I'd rather you have more fats. So I'd rather you have more olive oil. So if you really want to control satiety, this is about the fat. Uh, so he could have two palm-sized servings of meat. Um, and then he should have uh, lots of olive oil, uh, avocados. Uh, if he's hungry, I would rather do that. Uh, and ideally, he's a big boy probably, so he could have four plates of vegetables. And if he's still hungry after that, if he wants another serving of meat, I'll give him this extra serving of meat. But he ought to have four heaping plates of vegetables first. Yeah, I, I, I used to counsel my, my weight loss patients that – I draw him a little picture and I draw a one inch cube of cheese, which has about 150 calories. And then I draw pictures of five bags of organic lettuce, which have about 35 calories. Uh, so you would have to eat five bags of lettuce to get the calories of one piece of cheese. And I've actually tried this experiment and I got to two and a half bags of lettuce before I had to quit because I was too full. Uh, and I could eat 10 pieces of cheese and still be hungry. And uh, so I absolutely agree with you. Even these big guys, I've never met a guy that I can't fill up with a lot of greens and a lot of olive oil. You know, it, and I, I, tell, I would tell my patients, I tell them now is, uh, we don't want you hungry. I want you, I, I want you eating um, uh, lots and lots of vegetables, lots of olive oil. The goal is to not be hungry. Yeah. So... Uh, but I don't want you eating all that meat. So uh, if you go, if you get four heaping plates of vegetables and you're still hungry and you want another serving of meat, then yes. But not until you've had your four plates of vegetables. Great advice. And if, if you have those four plates of vegetables, you'll have your friend behind you uh, thanking Help. you the next day. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. All right. Dr. Wallace, Terry, great to see you again. Uh, Thank you for everything you're doing, and uh, thanks for joining us. And thank you. Before you go, I just wanted to remind you that you can find the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Because I'm Dr. Gundry, and I'm always looking out for you. 